If indeed um, what I do is art, I view myself in many functions, a craftsman, a diplomat, like a consoler, you know, an editor. If indeed, once again, I am an artist. I wanted to come from a place of great integrity, of the highest craftsmanship, so that it lasts an incredible time. But it's for superior stories. Superior stories that will give a backbone to a nation that would rather eat at other people's houses, tables, and, and still not get full because it doesn't have that soul. Like, don't go eating at other people's houses. Do you know what I mean? And now I'm not trying to be like, oh, be, be polite and then go eat. No, so go, don't go eat at other people's houses. That's a polite thing to do. You must just soma, feed yourself with food from here and then go eat at other people's houses or else we are going to create this culture of extraction whereby the plate will always be damn full at other people's houses. I see all of this that has happened, this beautiful rainbow of our participation in contemporary African art. I see it, it's beautiful. It has empowered me, it has empowered so many people that I know whose stories are so necessary for this country. But the economics of extraction are still something that we negotiate. And modernism, getting face to face with it, we need to be face to face with it. As black artists, as African artists. I started my practice in 2006 where I was like using various characters to explore various things, right? In 2006 I started with Miss Congo, 2007 it moved on to Injibaba, 2008 it was Beirut, who was a response to Nabisang Mukana's humiliation with the miniskirt attacks. I feel that a promise that was made to me with the constitution and being raised at the time that I was raised in, I was 10 in 94. And I grew up in, in this miasma of sort of like cohesion, of social cohesion. As, as, and of course, things were not taken care of, i.e. trauma. So in 2010, um, I'd started working with a character called the future white woman of Azania, who um, somehow was a, a complete um, send up of um, many ideals we have and utopias that we have made up for ourselves. The, the characters themselves are like balloons that are made up of a myriad of colors. Uh, I chose that as a way of referencing the rainbow. I used to put in um, solutions like water or colored paint or whatever so I could leave traces. They weigh you down somehow and they somehow cause you pain and I, I found a greater, a, like a profound thing with regards to that where it was like we all layer these identities on ourselves or people layer them on us nationalism, gender, um, sexuality, class. And these things hurt because we just take them on too much, you know? And the process that I, I wanted to, to, that the narrative of the performance or the synopsis of the performance was for me to have this, all this weight, identity weight, and then have it pop so that my body becomes lighter. I felt that that somehow also is something that all of us could do you know, as a way of entering this conversation about how we belong in nationalism, you know? What makes us South African? Especially knowing just how contradictory its, its story is. But also I realized in that that democracy or freedom is not, is not something you get to. It's not a utopia, you know? Um, it, there's nothing final about it that is ready-made, that is all flowery, streets of gold, all of that. It's all a process. And I think those um, events like the xenophobic attacks, um, Kwesi's rape trial, somehow made me double take the idea of how I was raised, you know, with Simunye, with Guaido, with Rainbow Nation. While, while in my reality, I was having people call cops on my dad because they refused to cut my hair because it was too kinky in George, you know? 
where I would be spit on because I was too effeminate, that didn't represent cohesion, you know, or a rainbow. I think that an image like the Knight of the Long Knives kind of distills what, 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 what this whole idea of the utopia is. When you look at it, you see this like beautiful cold blue light happening in like this flora that, that comes from every corner of the world if you look at it deeper, you know? There's the zebra, the saber-toothed zebra, there's the uh, future white woman of Azania who um, looks festive and disarming because of the colors. There's a flip side to it. The Night of the Long Knives is when Nazi Germany was um, purging its leaders. Um, right before World War Two, and also there is the conspiracy of the Night of the Long Knives in South Africa. It, it's it's been around for for a very long time, and it became more to fall to the front with um, Nelson Mandela becoming president and this whole idea of the Rainbow Nation happening. However, there was a far right wing sect, you know, in South Africa, and I think that it's quite a lot of people actually who are in the right wing who believe that the Night of the Long Knives would happen to them if um, Nelson Mandela died, which is quite pathetic because it then takes away from South African people who had to make so many sacrifices in the past 24 years, um, whether by feigning or really truly being um, convinced that we are united and, and just slap them in the face by saying that your freedom depended on this one man and if this one man dies, you guys are going to basically go back to barbarity or perceived barbarity and for me once again that is such a traumatic thing to to hear from your fellow countrymen you know in this environment of la di da we're winning world cups we are getting quieto we are doing afro chic we're afro futurist whatever you know and also it speaks to like the greater right wing that is rising white supremacy rising in the world and I think you internalize those things and you find characters like I did or you find happy scenes that will somehow be an, ac an access point for the kids, for the adults, for those who do not want to listen to it when it's overt. You know, for the ones who have to be seduced because seduction is a way of getting information and convincing someone. And then once they get in and are disarmed by this color and this procession and these imaginary zebras and while knowing that this is happening in Azania, whether your Azania is full of dashikis and afros and that's another thing because within the family there is this imaginative cultural where there's, there's a, a war on the imaginarium, you know, a fundamental war on the imaginarium as to how I should react to my past experiences, my lived experience, and how I should aestheticize it. The title, Azania, I'm trying to make sense out of a tale I was told, a tale that was promised to me, one that I pledge, of course, as a kid who was raised as a Pan-Africanist, to fulfill in my work, in, in my conversation, and everything, right? So land is very important on that side in the sense that I am imagining a land. Dreaming of that Azania is, is such a, a common thing. We dream of it because many beautiful things are on the other side of the fence. I then want to start telling the tale of how I'd like to decorate. Like I make sculptures to try and sort of like... to, 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 to say this is how I'm going to decorate the new Azania. Do you know what I mean? But these are the things we can put in. These are the people that we can memorialize, you know? These are the people that we can bring back from intellectual exile, from um, epistemic exile, from, you know, gender exile, you know? Because you can be exiled and blacklisted for your gender and making certain moves out there. Here now with the sculpture, I'm trying to memorialize queens in exile. So basically, it's uh, homosexuals, women, um, queers, femmes that we have 
have somehow forgotten in this Rainbow Nation exercise in us remembering their contribution and various other things. So Simon Koli is the, our first queen in exile that I've deified or I've somehow put on a plinth literally to remind people of who he was and his contribution to um, the anti-apartheid and also the gay liberation struggle because he was both. You know, he was the founder of the gay and lesbian organization of the Vedvatis Front, GLO, and um, also was uh, one of the Delmas Trees and Trials at quite a young age. So, in the Delmas Trees and Trials, we're always like, uh, he always writes in his letters to his partner that there were some people that were actually fighting because of his sexuality, thereby exiling him from the exile he was in. And then on the other side, there were also conflicts with white gays and black gays with regards to who's going, how far can you take the politics? Is it just gender politics or is it human rights politics, period? You know, including race and um, um, sexual orientation. So I find that in my head, there's a lot of characters that have been pushed away from so many things that they don't fit into the general making of nations. With Future White Women of Azania, it ends with that image of um, that was taken from the Zulu Wars um, that I intervened. I basically took an old colonialist image and um, inserted Future White Women of Azania in it and, and, and brought it so that that image makes more sense to my generation now and actually adds value to my experience and how I actually experience the land. There's the Queens in Exile, whereby now people are being banished from their lands, whether they're gay, whether they're non-Christian, whether they're black, whether they're poor, whether they're women or femme, you know. In so many ways I've been realizing exile. So for me, once again, dealing with that trauma or whatever, I somehow created this voyage of all these characters from the future white women of Azania going to this island, um, which I've named Nongause Island. Um, in, in, in the series, um, Queens in Exile. So they live in an exile island. It's a metaphor as well as old as time. But in mythology, it has so much informed us. That island across the, the, the bay is such a big part of, of, of how we made our men or our liberators. You know what I mean? And it's unquestionable. So I started digging into like hearing conspiracy theories about Nongawa going there in 1857 and then also finding out that Queen Gaki of the um, Mankoma's um, queen <laughs> um, was actually there after the, the 19, uh, 1857 um, cattle killings. The name of the piece was called Liza Lisei Dingalako, an autistic imperium. It's a very long title. I like long titles. It started in 2014 where I wanted to create a classical composition of the versatile Queen Ivy who basically started the revolution in the old Azania that led to her and the future white women of Azania being banished to um, Nongause Island, right? Seated on it is our Queen in Exile, the versatile Queen Ivy. I call her the versatile Queen Ivy because many people still do believe that people in frocks are only like passive. Also at the same time, I wanted that image to have, to be a roll call. Starting from the left where we have uh, Istualandre. Istualandre is a, is, a, is a historical warrior, but it's usually a male who gets given um, this, this like feather of a crane, Indre, which is the national bird. And was the national bird um, of the Siskai, where most of my artistic memories come from really. Were the females Talandras to begin with? That was my question. And then from then onwards, I created an avatar that would be a proposal to that. A monument to that. Because history always gives, and our records within the ANC or whatever show that there's a disproportionate amount of men to women with regards to their highest order, which is his Twilight. Once again, it's the history of the Rainbow Nation being revisited by someone who is a proponent of it and, and saying that here are some holes in between the rainbow and, and let's, let's revisit and redress and my job is to redress that. And then we move down to um, the character that's bandaged. I've been using the bandages since 2009 with Ilulwane. Uh, bandages for me it's just the body. Sometimes the body can be so sore that it feels like a wound, you know? And I think that also with the TRC and also a lot of South African like 
literature, it always speaks about us being an open wound or a walking wound, or a walking, breathing wound. Uh, we, we are overshadowed by that mythological metaphor. Actually, it's not mythological, it's, it's real. We're a post-genocidal society. And then we move down to um, another character that is now at the dead center, who is um, the versatile Queen Ivy, who is basically the queen in this exile. Took me four years to decide on the face. So it ended up being the face of Unombuku, um, my maternal grandmother, who was exiled in many ways. Her um, father was part of the people who made the pact um, under the thingy tree, I don't know the name of the tree, but there's a pact that Amamfengu made with the British after um, allying with them to fight against the Kossas. So they ended up being allocated the land in Pedi um, for their service to the British. Her husband moves to um, Port Elizabeth with industrialization and everything, becomes a petrol attendant and leaves her with the kids. The story of many South African women. So the husband gets exiled and goes to the city. Um, economically exiled. She and her sister joined together and opened a dairy and they managed to actually do quite well and sent my uncle and my mom to quite a good school, Hilltown. And I'm, I love how that story becomes about land. It becomes about claiming and wrestling the land. It's about the contradictions within land and somehow finding a space where we can reimagine it again. Because whatever that land is, is going to have to be filled with beautiful things. And then we have Indwe, which is the national bird. There's dry land, there's a lot of dry land and dry historical land with the future white woman of Azania. It's tropical, it's got, it's got big skies, you know, big red skies. And then in Queens in Exile, we start with this voyage on water. And the water thing is quite musical because for me, I'd always imagined Utiyo Soga playing Lisa Lisi Tingalako like while no Ngawase is going to the island and while all the future white women of Azania are going to the island. itself becomes another it's called over the rainbow so it starts now bringing the, uh, the, the 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 audience attention to the idea that we're dealing with a rainbow so i see the rainbow as this arc i see the narrative having an arc and the narrative is that of liberation and the imagination that inspires liberation and it starts with this artistic expression of a diosoga saying lisa lisi tingalako a song that was made in 1857, that's a freaking long time ago. Because now we know it as a song that has kept us through exile. This also becomes something, this drive of wanting to bring those faces that have been omitted into light is something that comes to terms with the video or comes to fruition in the video. You see me having all those faces of people and they're not like, great and amazing artists who are like masters or whatever because I don't come from that school. I come from a tradition that I think is even longer than those people in the video. Like I can say from fucking rock paintings to beadwork to many forms of creative cultural communication, the struggle song, modernism, the Harlem Renaissance, you know, Feral Benga who has been this character I've been working a lot with, Simon Goli, moving forward to Eco Mash, to Brenda Fassi, you know, working like bringing out all those people and monumentalizing them because God damn, we've waited 24 years to be monumentalized and A, we're still being monumentalized in bronze that is being mined by who? <laughs> oh, no hateration, but we need to find better stories and better ways of telling stories and memorializing things. And I think that um, Queens in Exile is about that, the many ways in which we can, we can make ourselves comfortable in this exile and we can prepare ourselves for when it ends. Because, great, we get the land. What will this land have? It will have us tilling and working on it beautifully. But we are going to need to like, be in a, 
in a space whereby we are spiritually and culturally okay. We can't arrive in Shabani's Pamban. Do you know what I mean? Pamban and Goku, like there's a lot of confusion. And for me, I think that my gig is to just be like, okay, while we are here, while these struggles are happening, while democracy is fulfilling itself, while um, fees are still falling, while all of that is happening, let's counter propose. Let's counter propose probably in a, in a much constructive and imaginative way. Let's remember the imagination, you know?